It is such a blessing to introduce to you Bruce Turkel. Bruce is a national branding expert. He coaches some of the top companies, top real estate agents in the world. Uh, I'm going to save my fluff about him and my edification because I want to, we're already late getting him on stage. And I just want to get myself out of the way as fast as possible and put Bruce on. Everybody, a warm round of digital applause for Bruce Turkel. Thank you, Rick. Let's see. First thing I have to do is take a deep breath and relax after we've heard of artificial intelligence. This has been artificial frustration. But the good news is I'm here with all of you. I see all your smiling faces. And uh, thank you, Shelly. I got that. Thanks. I appreciate it. And we have a lot of interesting things to talk about. What's so fascinating to me about this idea of artificial intelligence is how it, the juxtaposition of how incredibly new it is, and at the same time, what a rehash this is of every technological advancement that has happened really since the beginning of time. The science fiction writer Arthur Clarke said that every new technology looks like magic. And of course, that's what AI looks like to us now. And so everybody's running around like chickens with our heads cut off, trying to figure out what to do. Probably no different than when the steam engine was invented or when Gutenberg invented the printing press. When he first invented the printing press, everybody went crazy. The printing press was going to change the world. It was going to put, according to them, everybody out of business, especially scribes. What got I don't think this is the proper use of the verb, but what got scribed? What did scribes do? They copied Bibles. The way that the Catholic Church was able to get such an enormous influence was that they controlled the ability to produce printed material because they had scribes. And when Gutenberg started printing, they were up in arms because scribes were going to be out of business. It wasn't going to work anymore. And this thing, as far as the church was concerned, was the invention of the devil. And they excommunicated Gutenberg because they believed that he was changing the world. Very similar to what a lot of people are saying about AI. But look what happened. Gutenberg actually started printing Bibles. In fact, in 1540, the Gutenberg Bible became the most widely distributed Bible in the world. Why? Because on a printing press, you could produce them much cheaper than you could using scribes. All of a sudden, the church realized this was the greatest thing ever. It was cheaper for them. They could have the scribes do other things. Illuminated manuscripts came along and they made Gutenberg into a hero. He got titles, he got land, and he changed the world. So these things keep happening. We get crazy. We start seeing the world disappear. And then we realize, wait a second, this is a tool. It's a tool that we can use. Quite often, the key to what's good or what's bad about the tool is actually in the name. If you remember, maybe 10, 12 years ago, when you started using social media, and social media was another one of these things where, oh my God, I have to be on Facebook, I have to be on Instagram, I have to be on what was then called Twitter, uh, I got to do YouTube, I, I don't know how to do all of this stuff, but you figured it out. And what you figured out was that media described what it was, just like a magazine, a newspaper, television, or radio. Social media was media, but the key word was social. Once you figured out, it wasn't enough to simply upload stuff. Look what I'm doing. Look at this. Look at that. Look at the other thing. Look at this home. But that you had to develop relationships with your followers when you realized you had to put the social in social media, all of a sudden the tool made sense and you knew what to learn and what not to bother with, what you should do and what you didn't need to do. Think about how many of you call yourselves, well, realtors, certainly if you have the proper certification and you belong to the right organizations, but you've moved what you call yourself to real estate advisors or real estate professionals. Why? Because the word broker has the word broke in it. And it dawned on somebody that selling yourself as someone who is probably going to be responsible for many families' largest investment probably shouldn't have the name, the word broke in their name. By the way, wealth advisors used to be stockbrokers. They figured it out as well. 
So now let's look at the word artificial intelligence. And the key words are obviously intelligence is what the software provides for you. But it's that word artificial that we really need some, to spend some time talking about. Now, providing that the entry to the webinar continues to work and you get to see all your speakers, uh, Rick lined up a great, great roster for you. Most of them are my friends. Sam Richter is a genius, truly, he's a genius. If I tell him this, he blushes, but it's true. He is a genius at technology. And in fact, I'm doing an event next week and Sam is coming in to speak because he is a bloody genius. He's going to tell you how to use the tool to specifically accomplish what you want. He's going to show you how to do it. I use all the things he's figured out. He's amazing. Jerry O'Brien is a brilliant branding guy. He's going to talk to you about how to stand out in this environment. Viral Workman has built a business out of nothing, an enormous coaching business. He's going to talk to you about the systems and all of the approaches you need to make this make sense. These guys are brilliant. What that means is that I have my work cut out for me leading into them. So what I want to talk to you about is the mindset you need to take the artificial out of artificial intelligence, how to make it work for you. And there's one key issue that you need to understand. Actually, by the time we're done, you will hear three. And I've written this up for you and I will make it, act, make it accessible to you. These are my notes for today's presentation, which I will share with you when I'm done. Uh, you'll get to get them. And they have these points. So you're welcome to take notes, but you don't need to. I, I grew up in the uh, advertising agency business. I ran an ad agency headquartered in Miami. We had nine offices in Latin America. We did lots of work in travel and tourism. And there's a motto in the advertising business. The day you win a client is the day you begin losing it. In the realty business, it's not much different. You call the final act of your deal the close. Think about that. You do business with someone. You spend a lot of time building a relationship with them. You sell them a property, a home. If you do commercial, you sell them an office. And when you're done, you close. Once again, a word that doesn't really suggest what you ought to be doing. The close should be the open for all the other things you want to do. So in the ad agency business, we had this same problem. Acquisition of new clients is much more expensive than retention. It's much better to continue to work for people than to always have to go out and find new ones. So I needed to understand why we lost clients. And it dawned on me that even if we did a good job for a client, even if we sold more product for them, even if we won design awards, if that's what they wanted, at the end of the day, when our contract expired, they would often say, yeah, we want to see who else is out there. And you all have had this experience. You have heard that someone you did business with years ago is either looking or buying or selling. And then you call them up. And they say, yeah, yeah, we, you're right. We, did a, we had a great time together. You did a great deal for us. But, you know, we've decided to go with somebody else. Question is why? So I did a lot of research. I really dug into this issue. And I figured it out. We don't actually know what our clients really want. We think we know what they want because they tell us their budgets. They tell us what they're looking for. They tell us they want proximity to schools or they want a certain amount of bedrooms or they need this or that or the other thing, but we don't really know. And so I would go to clients. Let's pick a hotel client. Cause as I said, we did a lot of work for Marriott and uh, Hilton and Somalia and other companies. And I would say to them, listen, we're gonna start working for you. Tell me specifically, what do you want? And they would look at me like I was an idiot. And they would say, well, we want more people in our hotel rooms. You idiot. They left that part out, but we know it was there. And um, I would say, well, that's easy. You don't need to hire us for that. All you need to do is cut your prices. And they'd say, what? And I'd say, all you need to do is cut your prices. If you cut your prices, more people will stay at your property. And they would say, no, 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 you don't understand. We want people to spend more money, not less. Oh, okay, well, that's easy. You don't need us. All you need to do is double your prices. And they'd say, what? 
And say, yeah, if you double your prices, every time someone checks in, they give you twice as much money. And again, they'd say, no, 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 you don't understand. The truth is I did understand, but this was a little exercise. They'd say, you don't understand. We want more people to give us more money. Ah, oh, but you didn't say that. That's called RevPAR, by the way, revenue per available room. You want more people to spend more money at your hotel. They'd say, of course. Say, yeah, but you didn't say that. If we had brought more people to your hotel, but you didn't get more money, you would fire us. So we work really hard to understand what they wanted. Now, you're wondering, why the hell am I telling you a story about hotel rooms? And the reason is, you need to ask yourself a simple question. What do you want? You've heard about this bright, shiny new tool called artificial intelligence, AI, chat GPT, and you're going to run out and use it. But the question is why? What do you want to accomplish? I wrote a book called Is That All There Is, where I spoke to 50 people who had retired, 50 successful people who had retired, and I asked them, what did you do to change your life? Here's the book right here. And uh, it's full, it's a big book because it's full of interviews with these people to find out what they wanted. And then I just kept asking that question. And I asked it of clients and I asked it of customers. And when I got up on stage, I would ask people, what do you want? And I asked you the same question, what do you want? If you ask most people, they'll tell you one of three things. And my guess is you would do the same thing. People will say, I wanna be rich. Or they'll say, I want to be happy. Or they'll say, I want to be fulfilled. I want purpose. Now, here's the issue. All of those things are squishy. They don't actually mean anything. What does rich mean? Does rich mean you can go buy your fifth house? Or does it mean you can afford to buy the car you want and put your kids in private school? Or does it mean you can pay for rent and pay for medicine? Rich means different things to different people. So does happy. What's happy mean? I was pretty unhappy when I couldn't log in. Then once I was able to log in and see all your smiling faces, I was happy. But that's situational. And then, of course, fulfilled purpose. What does that mean? Is it religious? Is it social? Is it familial? What is it that you want? If you don't know, then you can't ask artificial intelligence to answer your questions. If you say, I want to be happy, it's going to give you a bunch of ways to be happy. You go, no, no, no. I want to be happy having more leads to sell homes to. It's going to show you how to do that. But you no, 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 no. I want to be happy having more leads to sell homes to within this zip code. Oh, but, and it's going to continue to not answer your question. I saw a great meme the other day. It said, don't worry about artificial intelligence taking your job. Apparently, you need to know what you want. So none of our clients will be able to use it. It was true in the ad business and it's true in the realty business. If your clients knew what they wanted, they wouldn't actually need you. There's enough information out there that they could find it and they could get the work done. But the truth is they don't know what they want. Even when they tell you what they want, they don't know. And it's your job to figure out who they are, what they want, what's available, and figure out that intersection. It's exactly the same when you use AI. Back in the agency business, we were lucky enough to win the Discovery Channel business when Discovery Channel was first coming out. And we did the marketing work to create what they then ran throughout Latin America. That's where I had the account. And I got to meet John Hendricks. John Hendricks was the guy that started Discovery Channel. And he brought all his, all his professionals in, his in-house people and all the consultants and all the firms that he had hired to talk about what he wanted. And he said, it's very simple. At Discovery Channel, we want to be everybody's second favorite channel. At that point in that room, you could hear heads exploding. Second favorite, one guy said, wait a second, I moved here. They were in Bethesda, Maryland. I moved here from New York City. I worked for HBO. I came here to be second best. Another guy said, a woman, excuse me, said, I moved here from LA. I worked for Warner Brothers. I came here to be second best. 
he made a point. He said, listen, I can't be everybody's favorite channel. This was in the beginning of cable, by the way. So movies, HBO, sports, ESPN, news, CNN, weather, weather channel. That's pretty much what there was. He said, if you're a sports guy, ESPN is your favorite channel. You're watching it. There's nothing I can do to make you watch Discovery Channel when your team is playing on ESPN. He said, if you're a movie guy, you're watching HBO. If there's a movie you want to see, there's nothing I can do. If you're a news guy, newswoman, you're watching CNN. If you care about the weather, you're watching Weather Channel. He said, but what happens when the game is boring? Or what happens when you missed, you're not going to be able to watch the end, so you're going to record the game. You don't want to see it. Where are you going to go? What happens when you've seen the movie before? At that time, you couldn't pull up whatever you wanted whenever you wanted it. What happens if you miss the beginning? I mean, you miss the beginning of Usual Suspects. The movie makes no sense. So if you miss that, where are you going to go? But if I'm everybody's second favorite channel, you know where to go. It was so simple. It was so brilliant. We all knew what to do. As marketers, we knew what to do. The um, people who created the shows, they knew what to do. They couldn't have shows that had beginnings and ends because you'd go to the HBO if you were a movie person, and then you'd come to Discovery Channel. If you remember the early Discovery Channel, you knew that at some point the alligator was going to drag the monkey into the river. But you didn't need to know the backstory. You didn't need to know why the monkey went down to the river. You didn't need to know the alligator's motivations for feeding its family. It didn't matter. They created programming that you could tune in at any time. We created marketing that pretty much said, when you're bored with that, come visit us. And it worked. Why? Because John Hendricks took the artificial out of artificial intelligence. He understood what he wanted. I think Rick knows that I'm a car guy. I got a bunch of old cars in the garage. In fact, I have one outside my window that I've been playing with. And if Rick comes over and I have the trunk up and I'm inside the engine compartment and I say, hey, Rick, do me a favor, hand me a tool. What does he give me? Does he hand me a screwdriver, a pliers, a wrench, a hammer? They're all tools. If I say, hey, Rick, do me a favor, hand me a screwdriver. Does he hand me a big one or a little one? Does he hand me a Phillips or a flathead or a Torx? Does he hand me a, a long or a short? You have to be very specific with your tool use. Yes, you can use a screwdriver to nail, to hammer a nail in, but it doesn't work as well as a hammer. You can use ChatGPT to do anything you want. But if you haven't figured out exactly what you want to accomplish, what it's going to do is give you a worse version of what you would have had if you would have done it yourself. Remember what Clark said. Every new technology looks like magic. But then every time someone shows you a magic trick and you're blown away, you say, do it again, do it again, do it again. And you're blown away. Once they show you how to do it, you go, oh, really? That's what you did? You put your thumb on the card? You had another coin in your other hand? That's it? That's the same experience you're going to have once you hear what Sam and Verl and Jerry have to share with you. As they're showing you how it works, you need to remember that what's most imperative is what you want to accomplish. So rule number one is know what you want. What you don't want is to use ChatGPT. ChatGPT is a tool. What you want is to write sales letters or do market research or figure out how to find who has the highest propensities to purchase. And then ChatGPT is the perfect tool to do it. I don't walk into the garage saying, you know what I want to do today? I want to use a wrench. No, I say, I need to change the oil. I can't get this damn oil filter off. Let me get an oil filter wrench and do it. The more things change, the more they stay the same. You figured this out in the past. Now figure it out now. All right, let's move on to rule number two. I was speaking at a conference. I know Todd has heard this story before. I was uh, speaking at a conference in Las Vegas. And 
the night we got there the day before. And the woman who was sponsoring the event asked me if my wife and I, she had traveled with me, if my wife and I wanted to join she and her husband for dinner. And I said, sure, we'd love to. So we go to dinner. And at some point during the dinner, the woman leans forward and she says, let me ask you a question. How long have you all been married? At the time, by the way, we had been married 25 years. And I start to say 25 when my wife says 23 years. So I kind of go 20. Because, Melissa, what I had learned in 25 years of marriage is that correcting my wife in public is not a good strategy. Rick has met her. He knows it's true. Um, so I say 20 years. But I also know something else is going to happen, which is my wife is going to figure it out because my wife's grandmother lived with us for eight years. She had dementia and she would ask my wife every day how old our son was. Cuántos años tiene Daniel? How many years uh, old is Danny? And then she would ask, how long have y'all been married? Well, she didn't say y'all, but how long have you been married? What she wanted was to figure out if we had been married at least a year before our grandson was born. And because she had dementia, she said it every single day. I'm telling you this because what I know is that my wife is thinking, wait a second, Danny's 23. And he, we were married two years when he was born. So we've been married 25 years. So she says, oh, I mean, 25 years. OK, that should be the end of the conversation, except... I'm a marketing guy. I want to know why this happened. When you sit with a client and you have sold the husband or the wife on the property, and then the husband or wife or a person they live with or whomever all of a sudden throws a wrench in the works, it's not a matter of simply fixing that. You want to know why, because you want to understand how to overcome the problem and what to do next time, right? So I'm trying to figure this out. Let's face it, does 23 years or 25 years matter? Of course not. It means roughly the same thing. I mean, if you've been married two years or you've been married 47 years, that's clearly a difference. But 23 or 25, it doesn't really matter. And so I needed to understand what was it that caused this whole thing to happen? And I figured it out. The next time, someone asks you how long you've been married or how long you've been together, whether you know the answer or not, there's only one correct answer. How long have you been married? Not long enough. Not long enough, besides making my wife happy, also establishes value. If I say 25 years, you have an interpretation of what that means. But if I say not long enough, it suggests that this has been a wonderful marriage, that it's going on into the future, that we're going to stay together, that I'm happy. I've added value to the relationship. When you use AI, you know what you're looking for. So the second rule is always add value. I'll give you an example. I was doing a presentation just yesterday, and part of it was to talk about how storytelling mattered to brands. And I was trying to explain the fact that anything that ends in ISM, ism, is a story. Whether it's imperialism or colonialism or communism, it's a story that's been created. Now, I wrote that out. I figured it out. I figured out what I wanted to say. But I want to add value. Instead of listing three things that end with ism, I want to list 25 things that end with ism. So I think it's very dramatic if I stand up there and I just recite all these things. So I go into chat GPT. Now, in the, before it existed, how would I find things that ended with the word ism? I would think of as many as I could, Catholicism, racism, perfectionism, right? And then I'd ask some of you, I'd say, Hey, uh, Shelly. Hey, Eric. Hey, Whitney. Can you give me some isms? That's what I would do because there's no way to look it up. You can't look up things by the uh, by the end letters. But I can go into ChatGPT and I write, please list 50 words that end in ism. And instantly, 
all of a sudden I have those 50 words. Why did I choose 50 and not the 20 or 25 that I needed? Because I want to remove the artificial, right? Some of them are words I couldn't even pronounce, let alone know what they meant. But existentialism, nihilism, it gave me the answer instantly. And I then put that into my talk. Once again, I knew what I wanted and I knew how to get value from it. It's a very simple example, but this example works for you as well. For example, if you have a property that has a particular advantage, uh, the size of the pool, the proximity to water, the number of cars in the garage, uh, spots in the garage, for example, you can use that to find customers who would want it. The house that we bought, that we live in, for my wife had to have a big garden and we live in, in Miami. We have a Florida hammock, a natural sort of Florida forest. My wife wanted that. I wanted a car with a, a house with a lot of garage space. My wife couldn't have cared less about that. And you know, I like the garden, but it wasn't my thing. However, you could use artificial intelligence to look through lists of people in car clubs who also happen to be looking for homes to tell you who would be most interested in a house that has a three car garage. Or you could use it to give you lists of people in a particular zip code that also were members of the Audubon Society and the Orchid Club at Fairchild Tropical Gardens, which is our nearby botanical garden. And my wife's name would have popped up because she would have met all of those criteria. And all of a sudden you could have called her up and go, look, I don't know if you're in the market for a home or not, but we have this home that for a garden lover, this would be a mind blower. And that's no different if it has an Olympic sized swimming pool or it has an extra large basement where someone could do some sort of hobby or whatever. I'm certainly not telling you how to do your job. What I'm telling you is that this level of technology can add value. Let's go on to point three. Um, but before we do, I have something. Um, I don't know how much time I have, Rick, because I know you have other people who are either in or out or whatever. Um, but I do want to take a minute or two, if y'all don't mind. Am I allowed to share the screen? I think I am. I want to give you this, this mind. I, th I think you are. And our next speaker is here. But Bruce, we started you a little late. So let, let's give you you know five or 10 minutes to, to put a bow on this. Perfect. I will do that. So I want to give you all this mind map because this explains exactly what we talked about, starting from the beginning and going all the way around. Um, so if you I have ability to share a screen now, thank you. So if I share the screen and I click on this and I say share, I believe you all see that. Yeah. OK, so if you take that QR code, if you scan that with your phone and then you see that there's a code, code is AI map which of course stands for artificial intelligence mind map. You scan the code, you put in the, uh, the, the code, you scan the QR code, I'm sorry, you put in the code and then it will take you through a couple questions and then you'll have access to this mind map. It'll also give you any of my contact information. So if you want more information about this, if you want to follow up, if you have questions, because we're not going to have time to do Q and A today, but if you have questions, then I am, Rick and I are good friends. I really want to give you as much value as possible. I am more than happy to take a call, take a text, answer a question. You'll ask your technical questions of the guys who are coming up. But if you want to have the big picture questions, the messaging strategy questions, that's what you'll ask me. So um, just scan that code, put in those five letters, and then you will get this in the mail. All right. I'm going to leave that up for a few minutes, but I'm going to move on. Yeah, definitely leave this up. And one thing I want to tell people too is Bruce is a talented artist. So he actually does these cartoons. Uh, also talented at the harmonica. He's just amazingly talented. Love having you on, Bruce. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate it. I, I want to make a point. I just looked at my notes and realized there was something I forgot, which is the idea of using new technology and old technology. You know, when you go to a conference, People give you a name tag. Hello, my name is, or the, the thing you hang around your neck. Now that we're on Zoom, which let's face it, is the high technology version of doing a uh, conference, 
we have the same thing in the lower left hand corner of everybody's rectangle is your name. Some people, uh, Donna Tyler, for example, not only have their name, but she gave it even a little more thought than most of us did. And she put the name of her company. So we know who she is and we know what she does. Think about that. Cutting edge technology. Zoom's only been around since 2017. So cutting edge technology, but using technology that's been around for 500 years, our names and our titles. If you lived in England 500 years ago and your last name was Baker, it's because you actually put bread in an oven. You were a baker. If your last name was Archer, it's because you worked for the king and you actually fired arrows. If your name was Bowman, you did the same thing. If you lived in uh, Germany and your I'm sorry, you lived in Spain and your last name was Aleman, it's because you were the consul to Germany. Aleman is German in Spanish. Names were our functions. Now, we don't do that anymore. Indira, his last name is Singh. It's not Indira Real Estate Advisor right? Um, let's see, Brian over here, his last name is Daga. It's not hedge fund, it's not Brian hedge fund manager. So we don't do that anymore. Yet we still present with that concept in mind. So as you think about how you're using this cutting edge technology, think of it as a combination of the old and the new. You want to use what's most powerful and most available, but you want to make sure that you're using it in the ways that work for you, which is an interesting segue to my last point that I want to get to, which is how things have changed and not changed back in history. Back in the 1700s, there was a guy by the name of Johann Sebastian Bach. Many of you have heard of him. He was a very famous composer, but when he started in the industry, he wasn't famous. And in fact, he couldn't sell his compositions because nobody wanted them. So he had to make a living. And he did that by being a music teacher. And he taught the harpsichord and he taught the viola. And lots of the music that he used became great pieces that later on were used in his compositions. And um, Rick was nice enough to tell you that I play the harmonica. So I brought one along and I want to play a uh, a piece by Bach for you. It goes like this. Now, You've heard that piece a million times. You don't know what goes into it, but you know what it is. In 1940, there was a guy in Vicksburg, Mississippi, named uh, Sonny Boy Williamson. Sonny Boy Williamson was also a musician, and he wrote lots of songs you've heard because they were redone by the, by the Animals, by the Yardbirds, by Eric Clapton. And he wrote a piece of music called Peachy Tree. And Peachy Tree sounds like this. Sounds like my audio is cutting out a little bit, but you get the point. Both of these guys are as different as different can be. Both of these pieces of music are as different as different can be. But they both use the same seven notes, do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, because that's all there is. Every piece of Western music ever written uses the same seven notes. When you use artificial intelligence, understand that every person who's using it is using the same data because AI goes back and combs through the same information, the same Wikipedia pages, the same USA Today articles, all of the same data. If you're not careful, what you do on AI will look like what I do on AI. And it will look like what every other person 
on this call, whether it's Donna or Andrea or Bob or, or Quadri, it will look like what every other person on this call uses. Because it's there's only seven notes. There's only so much data. And that brings up point three. If point one is know what you want, and point two is always add value, point three is what we've been talking about the whole morning. Remove the artificial from artificial intelligence. Do not take what you pull off the internet and repurpose it as your own. Instead, add your own personal flair, your own knowledge, your own heart, your own personality. Use it as a tool. Let it help you be the person you want to be. Do not let it replace you. You'll see very quickly when you read through listings and other things, you will know instantly the people who allowed AI to do the writing for them. When you see the things people send out, you will know right away the people who have allowed AI to pick the photos or to pick the images or to go after the market. But you guys are all professionals. You all know exactly what you're doing, how to do it, where to do it, when to do it, and why to do it. Simply use AI to make everything you do better. Thank you very much. Oh my gosh, Bruce, thank you so much. There, when you're in the presence of greatness, it's just you humble yourself, you put on the ears, you put on the mute, and you never want to get Bruce to stop talking. I just, the, the greatest gift would be to spend like another eight hours with you. I, that was just fantastic. And I really, really appreciate that. I hope everybody got a chance to scan that QR code. If not, I will get that back up later. It's a very, very short questionnaire for a tremendous amount of value. Uh, I'm in Bruce's, is this all there is group, the Atati group. I'm in everything that Bruce offers. I do because I get massive value from what you offer. Bruce, I'm so uh, apologetic um, for, for letting you in late. I'm, I'm thankful that you're gracious enough not to, not to hold that against me. And you handled it with such grace. Thank you, Bruce. I really, really appreciate that.